when the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1st, 1863. It did free some enslaved people. It freed the enslaved people from the Winchester Berryville area to the Potomac River, the areas of Virginia the Union Army occupied and controlled. The northern Shenandoah Valley in 1863 and throughout most of the war was a contested area. Enslaved individuals, residents, and partisans on both sides measured their actions with caution based on their judgment of the situation in their specific area. Locations today that are a few minutes automobile drive or half or full day's walk, what you said and who you said it to could have severe consequences. Complicating the situation even more than the occupations of the major armies were the operations of partisans, irregular military forces formed to resist control of an area by an occupying military. Both the Union and Confederate armies had partisans. This is the story about one Confederate unit's leader, Andrew Leopold. Confederate raiders, cavalry troops meant to steal supplies and generally harass enemy forces were also operating in the northern Shenandoah Valley area. One Confederate raider operating in the Shepherdstown Winchester Berryville area was a Confederate raider named Andrew Leopold. Leopold, aka Leipold, operated from the Shepherdstown area, now West Virginia, to Berryville, Virginia. In 1862, after the Partisan Ranger Act was passed by the Confederate Congress, raiders like Leopold started operating in the name of the Confederate cause. Leopold's job for the Confederate cause was to find conscripts, carry mail between homes and soldiers, steal horses and watch the movements of the Federal Army. Leopold, in carrying mail, is also enabled to determine the names of and the whereabouts of able-bodied men not listed in his Confederate Army, such as Jacob Hudson and Charles Entler. On April 21, 1862, the Confederate Congress passed the Partisan Ranger Act. The law was intended as a stimulus for recruitment of irregulars for service into the Confederate States Army during the American Civil War. The act reads as follows. Section 1. The Congress of the Confederate States of America do enact that the President be and he is hereby authorized to commission such officers as he may deem proper with authority to form bands of partisan rangers in companies, battalions, or regiments to be composed of such members as the President may approve. Section 2. Be it further enacted that such partisan rangers, after being regularly received in the service, shall be entitled to the same pay, rations, and quarters during the term of service, and be subject to the same regulations as other soldiers. Section 3. Be it further enacted that for any arms and munitions of war captured from the enemy by any body of partisan rangers and delivered to any quartermaster at such place or places may be designated by a commanding general. The rangers shall be paid their full value in such manner as the Secretary of War may prescribe. The effectiveness of Leopold in gaining supplies and conscripts for the Confederate cause is unclear. In finding conscripts, Leopold was doing little more than impressing people unwillingly into the service of the Southern cause. One incident of impressment that went wrong involved the shooting and killing of Theodore Mort Cookus. Leopold's rangers were operating in the vicinity of Dam No. 4 on the Potomac River where Mort Cookus and family were trying to cross the river to Maryland. Mort had crossed the river in advance of his family when Leopold's rangers showed up on the Virginia side. Theodore Mort went back to assist in getting his family across the river and away from the raiders. In the ensuing altercation, Leopold called Cookus a damned Yankee and started shooting at him. Mort was hit in the side and started swimming across the river. Leopold and other of his rangers continued to shoot at Cookus until he slipped below the water. What is clear is that Leopold was involved in the shooting of Theodore Mort Cookus. Normally, a deserter would be brought back to the officer who ordered the apprehension. At that point, a soldier would face a court-martial. An execution could be the punishment of military justice, but that was for the commanding officer to determine at a trial. By calling Mort a damned Yankee, 
Leopold was showing personal bias, if not outright hatefulness towards Cookus. There is no evidence that Cookus had joined the Northern Army. He may have been a deserter, or may have been like the hundreds of thousands of other troops from both sides, simply trying to get away from the war. Leopold was letting his personal opinions override his military duties. On March 6th, 1862, Leopold was in Shepherdstown on one of his mill routes. Earlier, he had heard that Jacob Hudson was talking about him in the town. Leopold went to the house where Hudson resided and asked for Hudson. Jacob, seeing who it was, got scared and ran out the back door of the house. Leopold then took aim and shot Hudson. Later, Leopold confirmed that he had shot Jacob Hudson to another resident of the town. Ten days later, after stealing six horses in a wagon, Leopold attempts to cross the river at Bridgeport, where a privately owned ferry is located. Three people were in the ferry house when Leopold arrived. One was Charles Ensler. The three men remained quiet because they knew it was Leopold and were fearful. Leopold proceeded to tear the shutters off the building. At that point, Charles Ensler made an attempt to run away. Leopold was quoted as saying, by God, I am Captain Leopold. I have been looking for you for a long time, as he shot Ensler. With the northern Shenandoah Valley being contested, the rule of law changed frequently. The law depended upon where and when the troops of one of the combatants occupied the territory. This made everyday life a constant assessment of risk. What to say, and who to say it to, had to be carefully considered. Information disclosed could come back and be deadly. Union General Robert H. Milroy was aware of the operations of Captain Leopold and very much wanted to stop Leopold's rangers. When General Milroy and his troops occupied Berryville in the spring of 1863, he was looking for information on Leopold's whereabouts. In the local general store, an enslaved person known only as Sam frequently shopped for his enslaver. With the types of supplies Sam was purchasing, General Milroy suspected he was enslaved by Leopold, or someone connected to his partisans. On subsequent visits to town, General Milroy questioned Sam who quickly confirmed that he knew Leopold and could identify him. In addition to being able to identify Leopold, he also informed General Milroy that he knew where Leopold was located. Milroy offered Sam $50 if he could help bring Leopold to custody. The reward made Sam all the more eager to assist in the capture of Leopold. $50 in today's money is about $1,474. To an enslaved person without income, $50 was a lot of money. Quickly, a plan was devised to capture Leopold with Sam's assistance. At great personal risk, Sam willingly accepted the assignment from General Milroy. The Capture Plan Sam would return to the land where he was enslaved and would light a match to indicate if Leopold was home. Upon seeing the sign, Milroy and 40 of his men would move in to capture Leopold, a straightforward, simple, and effective plan. At dusk, Sam was on the other side of the Berryville Creek near Leopold's hideout. Milroy's troops were across the creek awaiting the sign. Sam lit a match. With the sign confirmed, Milroy's men moved in to capture Andrew Leopold. Milroy's men moved swiftly enough to surround the house where Leopold and his men were located. Milroy's soldiers threatened to burn the house if Leopold did not come out. At that point, Leopold surrendered without a shot being fired. Upon Leopold's arrest, he was charged with being a guerrilla, the murder, being a spy, and violating an act of war, all crimes associated with his partisan operations. Ibid. Leopold, upon his capture, tried to negotiate his release with General Milroy by offering information on the Confederate spies in the Shenandoah Valley switching sides to the Union, or being allowed to leave and go to Ohio. General Milroy, after investigating Leopold, did not trust him and had him packed off to Baltimore in irons. Leopold was transferred to Fort McHenry, where he was tried, found guilty, and hanged in the fort. The Baltimore Sun noted that he, Leopold, was a desperate man 
a guerrilla chief, and a spy, and a murderer of the blackest dye. The execution occurred on May 23, 1864. General Milroy paid Sam for this information to capture Leopold. Sam's attitude was noted as he was more interested in getting rid of his enslaver than concerned about his personal risk. After Leopold's capture, Sam remained around the Berryville area. Later, Sam would pay a high price. After Leopold's arrest, his band of partisans encountered Sam and shot him dead. 6th New York Regiment Record This is the only account of Sam's death. Actions like the murders of Charles Ensler, Jacob Hudson, Theodore Crookus, and the murder of Sam were some of the many incidents that caused the Confederate Congress to disband the partisan rangers. Many of the ranger groups operated without military discipline. Incidents like these shootings were more criminal than legitimate military operations. Partisan rangers, except for Mosby and McNeil, are not documented to have contributed significantly to the Confederate supply effort. Robert E. Lee and others urged the Confederate Congress to discontinue the use of irregular forces. From the Confederate point of view, the killing of Sam was unnecessary destruction of property. Today, we obviously see it as a murder. In either case, the actions of Leopold's raiders were not seen as legitimate military actions. The Confederate leadership, like the Union leadership, later opposed the use of irregular warfare. Fearing the lack of discipline among the rival guerrilla groups could spiral out of control. On February 17, 1864, the Partisan Ranger Act was repealed after pressure from Robert E. Lee and other Confederate regulars persuaded the Confederate Congress to repeal the act. Only two Partisan Ranger groups were exempt and allowed to continue to operate to the very end of the war. The Mosby's Raiders and the McNeil's Rangers, both independent partisan ranger groups, operated in the western counties of Virginia and were known to exercise military discipline when conducting raids. From 1860 through 1865, the Shenandoah Valley was a contested area. The advancement and withdrawal of regular forces and the operations of partisans made daily life of the residents a complicated landscape to navigate. Partisan rangers like Leopold were little more than armed gangs of criminals. Both the government and the Confederate government found partisan rangers to be problematic and withdrew the authorization of such groups in 1864. We hope you find these videos informative. Please like and subscribe. We hope you find your guiding star.